Hi, Nina. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Nina. It's great to be back for another great AIM webinar, this time for part two in a discussion with Iron Mountain about their new five-phase digital transformation model. Digital transformation, of course, is a term that we hear quite often. Businesses want to digitally transform their operations and move away from paper-based systems. But despite the trend and the desire, many organizations continue to work with paper in many key activities like client and employee onboarding, accounts payable, finance, or contract management. Indeed, according to our research here, 56% of the organizations that we surveyed are looking to automate their manual processes. But there are a number of important steps and strategies that are needed to succeed. And that's what we're here to talk about today in the form of a new digital transformation model from Iron Mountain that is designed to help us step through the best practices towards success with digital transformation. Briefly, the five steps are identify, scan, store, automate, and unlock. And last time we discussed the first three elements of the model, identify, scan, and store. And as Nina mentioned, if you're not, if you weren't with us for part one, you can check the resources and the chat feature for a link to the replay of that webinar. Um, Nina, I want to be sure that our chat feature is enabled. I'm getting some messages here that people are having. Ah, okay, very good. Looks like it's resolved. Very good. This time around, as I mentioned, we are going to focus on the last two elements of the model, which are automate and unlock with our guest experts today, Nicola Bagwell and Brian Apple from Iron Mountain. Nicola is the director of go-to-market and customer success at Iron Mountain and has led many different teams under her 20-year tenure with Iron Mountain, but most currently, she's focused on solutions that utilize artificial intelligence alongside information governance in cloud-based environments. Joining us also is Brian Apple. Brian is a senior solutions architect at Iron Mountain, also with 20 years or more experience focusing on digital document solutions, addressing complex vertical and horizontal applications. He has deep understanding of both business and technical requirements and specializes in platform-based workflows and automation. So Nicola and Brian, welcome to the event today. We are talking about the new digital transformation uh, model. Nicola, before we dig in too deeply, can you give us a brief uh, perspective of why you feel the new model is such a powerful tool for information practitioners today? Absolutely. And thanks for having us on today. Really appreciate the time. Um, I think a lot of people, if you were attended the first part, you remember those three, uh, the first three sections we looked at, the identify, the scan and the store. And that's all around, those parts are, are all around being able to identify what you have, scanning what you need, store um, what you then can get value from. The next two parts of that really go into um, the automate and unlock. And the reason that this is so powerful is because it really provides um, our teams the ability to create that structure for customers out of all of the unstructured data that they have out there. We all know there's a vast amount of data. There's a plethora of data coming into organizations from so many different conduits. And it's a struggle to really look, manage that data and create sense of it. Get used to that data in all the different ways that it can be used throughout an organization. So it's really about bringing that structure, bring spending time where necessary to give digital transformation the right path to full success. Nobody wants to spend all of the money without, without a good ROI. And going through this process really helps our customers understand what it is they're trying to get out of their data. What are the aims of their business? What are those external challenges they face? What are the business um, objectives that they're trying to answer? And also, what are their internal challenges? Those three things are critical. And during this process, it allows us to help identify those with the customer through various stakeholders to really get the value from their data to help them move forwards. Well, Nicola, 
tell us a little bit more about the specifics of automate and unlock. It seems like the first three elements of the model really get us grounded, get us in a place where we can be more innovative and informed. Now the automate and unlock portions seem to me to be where we can make some progress, move the needle, if you will, with digital transformation. What exactly do you mean by automate and unlock? Yeah, you're right. It, it, these two are all about moving the needle with digital transformation. You don't just want to have your content in a repository and it's just accessed every now and then. You want to be getting value from that content. And the automate part is really all about bringing efficiencies to your organization. So the workflow piece, it's making sure that you're understanding where you could take um, risk out of those workflows. Where are the where's the human interaction where it doesn't need to be? Are people inputting data from screen to screen, for example, because then they don't have that data connected in or that other platform or application connected into their repository to allow them to have a seamless operation through workflow. You know, and this all means really with the automate piece, it's not just automating workflow, but it's automating collaboration. So a lot of tools out there, and you want to be able to make sure that when you've got the right information, that you can collaborate with other parts of your organization or externally to your organization. It's not just about putting data through a workflow, you know, going from step from step to step, and then something approves that workflow at the end or rejects it. It's also about sharing other content because digital transformation is not just about engaging workflow um, and putting workflow in. It's all about using the data effectively. And automation also allows collaboration. It allows you to share content. It allows you to really focus in on what's valuable to the organization through those tools. And I said it's you know, removing risk. A lot of automation activities are there to remove risk from process or from content, from people using content in a different way, duplicating content, spending more money that they need to. All of these things um, really help automate processes. And then the next stop step on top of that unlock is that next that top part of the pyramid. It's taking all of the other great work that you've done and really flushing the value of that content out to, for it to be identified and interpreted in the right way by the organization, whether that's for patterns and trends, whether it's to extract data to be able to um, inform other communications um, or other materials, for example. It, you know, it really is a getting access to that data, make getting structure from all of the unstructured data that's there. And monetizing where possible. If you can flush that value out, you can start to monetize your content in ways that you hadn't previously thought about. You know, not only that, and we've talked about sharing content, but it allows you to bring really strong governance as well into across your data. It's now fully structured. You can bring governance through um, and make sure that the data has been available when it should be to the right people and in the right timeframes. Nicola, you mentioned three important things there, collaboration, uh, increasing collaboration, reducing risk, and really boosting value. Those are three very key indicators of uh, moving forward, moving the needle, as we said here. What, what, how do we do that now? What are some best practices and capabilities that are essential in these phases of the model? Yeah, and, I, and it, it's these things all they're always common sense and we all know these things when we look at them. But when we start digital transformation practices, and especially when we get into the more technology advanced side, it's very easy to get lost in either a very granular detail and you know kind of go down a rabbit hole and a warren without kind of coming back up for air and really thinking about these. So you know, it's very easy to engage with just one stakeholder or two stakeholders within an organization. And they often can be the, uh, the purchasers or the line of business owner, for example, the decision maker. You really need to engage all of the teams and get into the tools. The end users are critical. And that really links into something that's not on here, but it, a change management. 
best practice, change management is critical in doing a digital transformation. Your teams and possibly your customers are going to have to do things differently. So you want to be able to articulate to them what that's going to look like, why we're doing it, what are we doing currently, what are the future use cases, where's the value going to come from. And, and within that, you want to do the easy stuff first. Break people in gently, break the organization in, break your customers in gently. Make sure that you're getting those wins up front for that success and help you frame success more within the organization as you get further through the more digital, technical, complex aspects of digital transformation. And you know it, that comes to the prioritizing the goals. You, you, you really have to understand what you want to do first and what that gets you. Prioritize what those goals are in the organization. If you've got something that's really critical, and it may not be the easiest stuff first, so sometimes you know those don't go hand in hand, but you have to prioritize what you want to do first. And as we said, celebrate and evangelize your success sharing that you know across the organization sharing it with others the making sure that people know that what you're doing is bringing this change to the organization you know reputation and your customers especially external public customers like to see organizations transforming and moving and bringing simpler processes that have a positive impact on them, whether it's you know, as an organization being able to meet demand more rapidly, you know, uh, get through a process, let's say mortgage process or something like that more rapidly, who doesn't want to know that they've got their mortgage faster, you know, those got a loan, those kinds of things. These, these are all important and you, tying bass back best practice to those goals and what you're trying to do is, is just so critical at the end of the day. Well, Brian, tell us a little bit more about the automation part of these phases of the model and a bit of the technical aspects to consider. How does automation play out in the real world today? Sure, thanks, Kevin. Um, and so as you can see on the screen here, we've highlighted a couple of what we think are key automation features. You know, automation's everywhere in the world. It's ubiquitous. Ever, everything we interact with in some way is, is probably automated today. But specifically, when we talk about digital documents and we talk about transactional business process automation, maybe these four things have been the things that Iron Mountain has identified with our customers as the most important. So first, feature extraction or, or pulling data off of documents, off of forms, out of digital feeds. It's not just the ability to get that account number or that uh, customer name or to properly classify that document, but it's critically important that you have verification and validation to give you confidence that that information is correct and complete. The second place where Iron Mountain sees our customers getting a lot of value out of automation is by automating a checklist process. You know, many businesses and, and in most of our lives, we make a shopping list or, or, or a to-do list or something like that. And similarly with digital document processing, making sure that you have all of the required documents as you move into and try to complete that process and having the necessary exception management to, to say, hey, we're missing this form and we're missing that form uh, or it's incomplete is really important. Um, we certainly see a lot of opportunity to automate decision-making, whether it's simple rules-based, you know, is the dollar amount within our tolerance or whether it involves people within the organizational hierarchy. So Iron Mountain is frequently involved in both approvals and other forms of decision-making that are fully automated behind the scenes, but also that directly involve the user interaction. And the last thing that I'll touch on is what we call human in the loop. Um, this is a process where, and this applies to all of these other elements, that when we do not have a high degree of confidence in the automation process, maybe an I looks like a one, or, or an eight looks like a three. If we don't have a high degree of confidence, we use people 
to look at those uh, elements and, and features and to verify them to whatever level of confidence is required by our customer. And so, you know, if we're processing a, a bank deposit, you really want that to be correct. You, you don't have a lot of tolerance for error. So we use human in the loop as a way to reinforce and to get us to the necessary uh, level of quality that our customers require. We are here today with Nicola Bagwell and Brian Apple from Iron Mountain, and we're talking about digital transformation, innovation, and a five-phase digital transformation model from Iron Mountain that we can use to guide our efforts. And Brian, we've been talking about the automate portion of the model, but now let's talk about the unlock aspects of the model. Uh, unlock. The focus on information management is often on things like saving money or reducing risks, but how can I unlock process improvements that boost the other side of the coin in terms of things like improving customer experience or organizational performance, really using digital transformation to give my organization a competitive edge? Yep, a absolutely, Kevin. And so when we say unlock, and, and this has a lot of meaning to a lot of people, but I've highlighted four areas here where we think this is really useful and important and where our customers are asking for help. And one of them is essentially pulling out new information, gaining additional revenue opportunities, uh, possibly finding information about your product or your customer that you didn't know that does give you a competitive advantage. Another thing that people are very concerned with today is recognizing fraud, uh, reducing fraud, reporting on fraud. And so we think that to the degree that we can use information and spot key factors in the data, a transaction that just looks uncharacteristic for those types of transactions you've seen before, that reduction of fraud is, is a key feature to unlocking uh, your, the value of your information. Uh, I think we've all seen with business analytics, people are constantly looking for trends, uh, whether those trends are geographic or seasonal or product related. Um, and so being able to, and the term that a lot of people use is to mine that deep data, uh, that certainly is a, is a key element. And uh, to be able to unlock that value, you have to have your information, your data elements and your documents organized in a way that allows you to quickly and easily perform those queries, map those trends, graph those, those variations from transaction to transaction. So that normalization of data starts to become an important element there. And then last but not least, you know, people today expect the systems that they interact with to work the way they want to work. I want to be able to change my screen. I want to put the buttons over here. I want to be able to take this process and make it a, a repeatable step that, that I just can click once. I want to be able to have my screen organized the way I like to work, which might be different than the way my peer likes to work. So we think that uh, unlocking key information also has to do with how people use the systems and the tools around them. Now, Nicola, can you give us a, uh, an example of one organization or a use case that you feel has been particularly successful using the automate and unlock portions of the model? What did they do? What were the results and how can we do it too? Sure. Um, we've got a couple of examples here. And the first one here is uh, around a court and tribunal. And this was uh, actually in Europe, but um, where members of the public request copies of people's wills that they've made, obviously, last will and testament and uh, probate. Um, 
and there was a real real problem here in terms of getting that public request as there's only a small number of officers that actually take these requests um, because those records are stored in central you know fairly central locations across the across the region and it's making sure that you can get those copies there's a big interest in genealogy and ancestry people unlocking their back their past, you know, wanting to know more about it. And one of the great things about using this kind of digital transformation program is knowing th th that you can actually unlock that type of content and, and automate a process of getting that. So rather than the previous process, which saw, you know, uh, orders coming through in a more manual way, being scanned and then emailed or, or provided to customers, what the this five step program allowed us to do and, and technology and, and that automate unlock piece was really put in an automated process for uh, end customers to be able to the public to request those copies just th through the internet they can log on they can make those requests the request automatically goes to a warehouse for the data to be pulled to be requested to be scanned if it doesn't exist already in electronic format if it already exists then the customer knows it's there they can make their payment and they can download that file that they're looking for you'd be surprised how many people want to know how much money princess Diana Anna left, for example, in a will, and as a matter of public knowledge. So these kinds of things, you know, they're important. And this is a different way of thinking about this. You know, this is a, a an organisation that has a huge public interest in the content that they hold for many different reasons. And they've been able to successfully automate that process, saving time, getting content to getting the requested content to those requesters much more rapidly. And that content is being used in so many different ways. And, and the unlocking of that allowed us in, through those processes to really give these uh, give the end users the ability to search across many different um, words and terms to get to the content they were looking for so they could find that and be very specific but it's it's allowed to do so that organization to really exceed the expectations and you can see from the screen the number of orders that came through and in the first month they could never have achieved those before within that 14 day SLA it was absolutely impossible so it's made such a big difference that organization yeah. I'll hand over to Brian for the second piece that's thanks and, and, and you know that, that's a fascinating example but you're absolutely right the scale is is part of what helped make that uh, very valuable to that to that customer to that government agency. In the U.S., we've had several opportunities around healthcare, and I'll just highlight what made this one a little bit unique. While the volume was not quite so big, the the stakes were very high because it's healthcare, and if you make a mistake in healthcare, uh, maybe bad things happen and, and people don't survive the way they should. So what our customer was challenged with was going over. Uh, this constant flow of incoming referral documents, some of them paper, some of them digital, and their process was that they needed to highlight certain medications or certain um, illnesses that were that they had identified as being critically important to good outcomes for that patient. So we were able to automate the finding of these key terms and, and normalize how those terms were expressed, and then unlock that uh, almost in the same way that uh, maybe you remember in school, you would use a, a fluorescent highlighter to take notes on a book. We actually read through, had the machine learning read through these, these referral documents and just highlight the drugs and the, and the particular conditions that this customer was most interested in. So they didn't have to spend hours pouring over hundreds or thousands of pages of documents. They could go right to the key areas in those documents and they could make a decision. And in fact, our machine learning actually scored the documents and suggested a decision, but ultimately that was their decision to make. So I think that's a powerful example also. Well, Brian, I'd like to see a little bit of this in action. Do you have a, a demo that you could share with us? Uh, well, what I do have, yes, I'd be happy to show you that, is a couple of screenshots. 
And what I'll do is I'll just sort of talk to these screenshots to give you some idea. This is all demonstration data, so there's no confidential information in here. But this gives you some idea how Iron Mountain helps customers with our product. But there are other products on the market that are very similar that can do similar things. So I think from, from my seat, these are the kinds of features that, that you should be thinking about to help you automate and to unlock. And so this first screen that we see here is what we call our dashboard screen. But the real idea behind this screen is it's bringing, in the case of the, the left-hand side of the screen, some recently edited documents right in front of me so I don't have to go digging around to find them. And on the right-hand side of the screen, some, some very simple metrics that are telling me right now what's important to me as a user, depending on the application and depending on what I'm doing. And going down the left edge, we do have a number of, of different icons that let you quickly and easily search and perform other actions. So let me go to the next screen here, which would be uh, an example of one of our search screens. And in this particular case, in the upper left, I simply used our full text search capability to put my name in there and got back a, a wide variety of thumbnail documents, including a nice picture of a cat um, that were in one way or another related to, to myself. And again, what we're trying to show here is how you can make these assets uh, very easily accessible to the users so that they don't spend a lot of time digging through long lists of hundreds or dozens of, of assets looking for what they look for. But ultimately, in most business process automation and most content services platforms, it's about getting to the document that you want to work with. So here uh, is an example. Again, this is just a demonstration document. I just pulled a, a typical commercial loan application document and filled in a couple of fields to help identify uh, that this was my loan application. And so in our platform, and I think in any reasonable commercial platform, you ought to be able to go from that dashboard very quickly and easily search for exactly what you want to work on and get that document on the screen in one or two clicks. If you can't do that, you haven't really uh, unlocked the value of those documents. Within these documents, far over on the right, we have some expandable fields that can show the various types of metadata that have been collected off of these documents and some create dates and some, and some other features. But it's really all about getting the right document in front of the right user in one or two clicks. Um, one of the other features that we take advantage of uh, very frequently that our customers are asking for is workflow. We have a very straightforward workflow model that can be illustrated in this little flowchart graph off to the side. Um, depending on the business process, our customers can take any document or the system can automatically place a document into a workflow where the document will programmatically move through various steps. If there's user interaction, as we can see over on the left, I can put in a comment. I can ask various people to do various steps. I can assign the work manually to individual people if I need to. But we can also have a fully automated workflow. So the system can make determinations. And so this is, again, not unique to our Iron Mountain Insight product. Uh, other products have workflow as well. But I really think you need to consider whether this workflow is simply a, a mechanism that lets you essentially just tag documents, because I've seen a lot of products where that's really all that the workflow does, or if this workflow can take that rule-based decision-making and help automate it. Uh, and if you need human interaction to have those call outs where that human in interaction would happen. So Kevin, that's a, a quick right. tour. Does that Very give good. you some idea of at least what our tools can do? 
Yes, and it's great to have the, the the model to provide us some important context as well in terms of how we frame our actions. So Brian, tell me, and I do want to open it up to some questions from our audience today, but um, so please, if you have any questions for Brian or Nicola today, please put them in the chat feature and we'll endeavor to get them here, uh, get them posed here in just a few minutes or just a minute or two. But Brian, how does Iron Mountain help us with all of this? Can you give us some resources or some next steps to consider? Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I don't think this should exclusively be a, an advertisement for Iron Mountain, but just in general, um, as you're thinking about your process and as you're thinking about what you need to be able to accomplish, you do want to consider this transformation journey, this, this pyramid, these five steps. You also want to consider whether you're going to do this work yourself or whether you're going to go uh, outside and, and get some help through a company like Iron Mountain, whether uh, you have all of the required steps, the physical handling and security of physical documents that might be important, which sort of clicks into that bottom level that identify, um, but, but being able to manage that and manage that process. The various digital services Iron Mountain has uh, nearly 100 imaging centers around the world. If global coverage is really important to you, um, that's something you seriously need to consider. And to try and do that yourself uh, could be quite a stretch depending on the, the footprint that your organization has. So I think you need to look at the physical assets and how you're going to convert or digitize those. And then the technology, Iron Mountain has spent a, a tremendous amount of, of money investment in the technology we use, not just um, low-code web-based uh, Insight product, as I was showing some screenshots here, but all of the uh, metadata management, the AI and ML models and inference models that we use to do classification and feature extraction. Um, the workflow, and last but not least, the management and uh, destruction or retention of that, those assets at the end of their useful life cycle. So, Nicola, anything you'd like to add? Anything I, I skipped over there? Oh, you didn't skip anything there, Brian. The, the only thing I would come back to is a few of the comments I made earlier on. Um, you know, and, and and well, actually, in terms of resources, obviously, AIM have fast, fantastic resources in this space as well to complement what we've got here. Um, but you know, in terms of next steps to consider, um, in addition to what Brian said, and coming back to my earlier comments really think about engaging all the right people within the teams, not just, you know, somebody sitting in isolation. Um, a digital transformation journey is that, and it never ends. This is, we all know that this continues. There's a lot of change in this field and you need to keep working forwards. And to Brian's point about whether you do it yourself or whether you engage with somebody to help you, you've got to consider the future of that journey. It's not going to just stop once you've done one section. You've got to a lot of different data types um, across your organization, lots of different types of content that can bring value. So it's really taking a wide view and, and working out whether you're starting with like a line of business area, back office area, um, or an organizational level strategy that's going to build through. Be very clear about where you want to move forward. Um, you know, those are the kind of steps to consider as you start this journey. We are here with Nicola Bagwell and Brian Apple from Iron Mountain. You can find out more at ironmountain.com. I do want to open it up for questions and answers here in a moment. But Nicola and Brian, it's been great speaking with you today. As we start bringing in questions, one last one. If you could put on your, your, your open up your crystal ball a little bit. What should executives and business owners and technologists, but all of us really be thinking about now and strategizing for in order to be prepared for the world in five years time? Yeah. You want to take that, Nicole? 
<laughs> uh, I'll start yet and then yeah, you can add in anything I miss, which I'm sure there will be something that always is. Um, <laughs> but yeah, and now, I mean, you can see lots of things on the screen here. You know, IG, information governance is critical. Or a lot of organizations are worried about compliance and fines around non-compliance in different areas or brand reputation, those, those kinds of things. Always think about exactly what needs to be in place for that uh, solution that you're looking for and through that journey. You really need to make sure that you are prepared and that you you know what you have what you need and where you need to spend the money to do some of the points very early on it all comes down to showing that success and take it easy on yourselves don't be thinking you know executives and business owners they often want that quick win take it easy these things take time these are not things in this entire journey this is not something that you can implement in in a couple of weeks or three months these take time you to do it properly and really get the value you need you have to invest up front and a lot of that time is spent before you even sign the contract because you want that contract to display exactly what it is you want and you want everybody to have the same understanding so invest in workshops with all of the right key people as i said not just decision makers and stakeholders but end users and anyone else who's valuable in this it etc make sure they're all involved it is really really critical you know if if all of that preparation work is done well up front and you've invested that time and money once you've signed the contract that's going to go a lot faster in terms of you getting what you need because you've done the due diligence up front and you don't have to keep stopping and starting because things haven't been considered and extend implementation and add cost because it, as changes have to be made it adds cost so don't be thinking and be in a rush to sign the contract by the first person that comes along with a whizzy solution really take time and make sure they understand your challenges and then not just talking to you about features and functionality because otherwise it's up to you to try and work out how they will fix your problem um, rather than the other way around. Brian, All right. over to you. Mm -hmm. Very let me good. just add just one last thing real quickly. Please. Mm -hmm. We've all heard, you know, the, the, the saying about don't try to boil the ocean or how do you eat an elephant, you know, in, in small chunks. I really, uh, I've seen a lot of projects get derailed because there is not agreement as to how big it needs to be. And uh, you take your first steps, in my opinion, they don't have to be big steps. You get little wins and that gives everybody confidence to move on. As I think, you know, Kevin back, you know, even what five years was doing, the kind of laptop I had or the kind of cell phone I had five years ago, um, technology and business move so quickly you, you, you need to take small steps and move forward. That's my opinion. All right, very good. Well, that is Nicola Bagwell and Brian Apple. Now let's open it up for questions from our attending folks today. We do have some coming in, uh, Brian and Nicola. Um, so please jump in as we see fit here. Uh, this one from Mason, um, is, he's asking, do you use RPA for process automation? Tell us a little bit about how that works. Brian, do you want to take that one? Yep, sure. So uh, we, we didn't rehearse the questions, obviously. Um, so uh, yeah, we're a believer in RPA. We use it internally for some processes where that makes sense. A lot of our customers are using it. At the moment, uh, where Iron Mountain feels RPA is the right choice, we are typically integrating with third party partners. So it doesn't have to be, we don't think our solutions have to exclusively be Iron Mountain. Um, the, the good part about RPA is it's generally not very sticky. You know, it's kind of a something that you can slap on. It is not the long term final solution to data uh, extraction or capture in my mind, but RPA is a good, quick, easy way to get data off of existing applications. Very good. And this one from Mary, uh, Mary Miller, and thank you, Mason and Mary both uh, for your questions today. Mary's asking, can Iron Mountain Insight be used as a records management system? 
So um, I'll I'll do a first pass answer and Brian can add anything in for this one if that's okay. So iMountain Insight has the ability, it has a physical asset management tool that's um, being integrated, but that works with uh, our own warehouse management system. So it allows us to see, uh, or a customer to see what they hold in physical content and also what they hold in electronic content on the same screen and, and order that content. It isn't designed as a full, um, um, physical content repository you can't you know use it that way but it is definitely in terms of electronic and physical you've got the connection between the two across our platforms and our systems to be able to integrate um, if we're talking about obviously electronic records or different types of data uh, insight can contact can um, take many different types of formats of content whether that is uh, you know, PDF, TIFF, JPEG, video, audio, all kinds of different content, images, you know, seismic data, all kinds of different things can be ingested and manage those through there. But physical, it is limited to the connectivity with our existing solution at this moment in time. Brian, feel free to add anything there. Yeah, the, so two things uh, to reinforce what you said, Iron Mountain strongly believes in retention and formal records management for physical assets, um, and, and for the most part, that extends to just what we're managing on behalf of our customers and to those digital assets. And for the most part, that's, that's what's with, within our repository. We are very interested in federated management uh, across other repositories. It's technically pretty complex, so we don't have a product that we've released that does that beyond our applications. But this is an area that we're always looking into and we always want to understand what our customers are asking for. But absolutely, if you don't manage it, it gets out of control, just the way all of our share drives are out of control today, right? Is there a limit to the number of workflows that can be established by the various users? Are, are the workflows tied to the digitized document types or by user groups or can they be a varied combination based on the workflow itself. Yeah, so let me just take that quickly. Um, so sure. broadly, think of a workflow as anything from as simple as I've got an inbox and an outbox, and I just wanna take new documents in my inbox. I wanna look at them or do something. I wanna click a button and move it to the outbox. That's a very simple workflow. Doesn't require lots of professional services and professional design to set that up. It doesn't require much to implement that. Many of the workflows that we're engaged in are very complex, hundreds of steps involving multiple data points coming from all sorts of different places. And those do require a lot of effort to properly uh, design them, to build them, to test them, and to keep them running and to maintain them. So it's a really broad spectrum. And what I tell my customers is, look, anytime we can take a low value task that you were doing manually and we can automate it, it's a win for everybody. So got to figure out what these tasks are and how, how complex they are, but it could be the entire range from very simple to ridiculously complex. Nicola, and uh, yeah, I would just add we haven't found a limit yet to the number of workflows established by various users on our platform. Um, we have the one that Brian showed can be triggered by users multiple times on multiple, you know, different documents and by other users. Um, there is no limit there. Um, and yes, it, it, you know, it can be digitized document types or user groups can be used. So like mail room, digital mail room, for example, user groups are often used within that kind of process as, as an example as well as you know through through digitized data okay but yeah there's there's a lot of different types of workflow out there <laughs> well very good we have been speaking with nicola bagwell director of go to market and customer success at iron mountain and brian apple senior solutions architect at iron mountain we've been talking about the five phase digital transformation model from iron mountain if you didn't see the first part of our interview uh you can certainly find it in the resources section here or find it at aim.org. Meanwhile, we've been talking about the second half of the digital transformation model here today. We hope that it's been a valuable conversation. I'd like to thank Nicola and Brian for being our guests today and turning it back over now to Nina. Nina, tell us more. 
Well, we have some exciting news regarding the virtual summit that's coming up. It is just around the corner. So if you love virtual events, you'll love what we have in store for you. It's designed around your work schedule. The 2022 AIM Virtual Summit offers two and a half days packed with expert-led sessions to take you above beyond, beyond the mechanics of information management and into a new dimension of leadership. So we are still, there's still seats available, but they are selling fast and you can register today at www.aim.org backslash summit. And as we are bringing this webinar to a close, a few last minute reminders, we have recorded this webinar, so you can catch anything you want to hear again in a recap email. And just like Kevin said, there is a part two that is on our YouTube page that we have dropped um, in the chat below. Um, don't forget to take our feedback survey as well and let us know how we did. So a big thank you to our underwriters, um, Iron Mountain, without support from our solution providers, we wouldn't be able to bring you any free educational programs like this one. Before we say goodbye, I would like to ask Nicola if there are any last minute thoughts you'd like to leave with our audience today. Um, yeah, just one really is, and I, and I said it before, but take your time, and Brian just said it as well, don't rush into something which can be a very expensive journey, and you can, can if you don't get the results you need, you may not get the budget for, again, going forward, so, you know, make sure you've prepared, make sure you're following steps, and that you're you're doing everything that you need to be successful, it is absolutely critical. Absolutely. And what about you, Brian? Any last one takeaways? I, I, I'm a big supporter of AIM. I've been active for over 20 years, so there are plenty of resources from AIM and Iron Mountain and others. So I just want to say thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Nina. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. And what thank about you. you, Kevin? Well, Nina, you know, I love this model. I think that it's an important construct for us, regardless of the technologies uh, and some of the details involved. As I mentioned early, most organizations are still looking to automate their manual processes. But how do I do that? It, you know, beyond the technology, what's the process that I go through as a practitioner to get this job done? And the five steps, identify, scan, store, automate, and unlock may seem self-evident, but it is a construct that can help us move forward and use best practices towards success. So I thank Iron Mountain for putting the model out there and being a thought leader in this, in this way. Absolutely. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And this is Nina from AIM saying, see you next time. Take care everyone.